Before we begin, please join with me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that for your goodness to us um, and for your grace to us, even though we don't deserve it. Lord God, I um, thank you that we can come and we can worship you today, that we can hear your word preached. Um, Lord, I pray that you would humble our hearts um, and that you would show us yourself and show us then, because the gospel is true, then how we live in light of that. So please would you give us open hearts to receive your word today and would you help Pastor Iggy, Lord, to preach your word faithfully um, and in your strength, Lord, and would you work in us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to win their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. This is the word of Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I'm back, and thank you so much for thoughts and prayers and dropping off random things and food and all that. I'm really, uh, we're all really appreciative of that. Uh, so thank you for that. I've, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, I just, I had COVID. It's not fun, guys, just to let you know. Um, some people, May was just telling me it's maybe a man thing, but I'm feeling a bit tired still, so, but, um, that's okay, I think I'll, I'll keep that up for a little bit longer. Um, I also want to, before I get into the sermon today, I just want to uh, say a big thank you to someone, and that's Auntie Angeline. Auntie Angeline, actually, um, she's not leaving or anything, guys, just so, but she's, she'll be um, taking a break from service leading after, I think, almost a, a decade, is that right? About, yeah, so about eight years or so, so a well-deserved break for Auntie Angeline, and she um, yeah, has a bit of a rest and spends a bit more time with the grandkids as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge the service that Auntie Angeline's given to us and the warmth and the passion she brings every time she's up here, I'm so appreciative of. So can we just give her a little thanks? I know she's not asking this, thanks. <laughs> we're, we're thankful to God for you, Auntie Angeline, so thank you so much for serving us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, friends, well, keep your Bibles open to that passage. It's a short one, but there's so much there. And actually, we'll be um, uh, drawing a bit from the passage that Pastor Matt preached to us last week as well, just to set it up. So just keep your Bibles open. We'll be having a look there. Now, in my home, there's five kids. Okay, so let me tell you. Do you know what's lacking in my home? Do you know? Peace. Yeah. <laughs> Peace is lacking in my home. Um, do you know, you know, I walk in, it's, it's utter chaos most of the time. There's, um, uh, you know, someone's uh, spilt their cup of milk again. Uh, someone has left toys all over the ground, not someone, everyone. There's two kids fighting over one piece of Lego, even though we have a million other pieces of Lego. They're fighting over that one piece of Lego. Um, it's utter chaos. Uh, it's not peaceful. It's a chaotic household very, very often. Who here has a chaotic household? Hands up if you have a chaotic household. I see most of the parents with their hands up. Yes, some of the teenagers as well, I think so. In the midst of chaos, what I, what I really cherish are moments of peace. And when I talk about peace, I'm not, I'm not just saying moments where there's utter quiet, where there's no noise whatsoever, although they are nice, those moments as well. Um, I'm talking about something much better. I'm talking about when things work that the way they should, when things work the way they should. That is actually what true peace is. 
I love it, the moments where we get to, and this is not all the time, but I love it when we have those moments where we sit at the dinner table together and we're all having a meal um, and we go around and we're sharing about, you know, what's our favorite part of the day? And everyone takes turns sharing and they do, and they actually take turns, they don't interrupt each other and we're all sharing. We're enjoying hearing what everyone's saying. Uh, we have a laugh when, you know, little Jakey says something funny together and we just enjoy that relationship that we have as a family. Who here wants peace like that? Who wants peace in their relationships? I'm sure we all do. Today, I'm going to talk about how we can have peace and how we can keep peace in our relationships. And when I talk about that, this is what I'm talking about. Relationships of peace are relationships working the way they should. All right? Relationships of peace are relationships working the way they should. And there is an underlying assumption here, I don't know if you noticed in that statement, that relationships actually have a particular way that they should work. That the relationships have an order to them. Now, even if you're not a Christian and you're here with us today, and I'm so glad you're here with us, thank you for being with us today, I hope you can see this. That relationships only work when there's order to them. Because you know, when does chaos happen in relationships? When does conflict happen? It's when there's two parties and they both bring to this relationship an idea of how things should be and they clash. I think that this should be like this and I think that this should be like this and we can't agree and I'm not willing to budge here. I'm bringing something different about how things should work. I, I feel like a certain way, so this is how I'm going to behave. You feel like that way, so that's how you're going to behave. And we'll just clash. That's not peace. It's chaos. Relationship, actually, they, they have an order to them. So how do we make our relationships work the way they should? Well, there's only one way. It's to go back to the one who created relationships, who created me and you, who created us, our great God. Because our great God has woven into creation a, an order, an, a, a way of things working the way they should. What I'm saying here, friends, is that there is a right and wrong way to do relationships. Did you know that? There is a right and wrong way to do relationships. And it's not up to you to determine that. God is the only one who can tell us what that is. So that's what we're going to look into his word, word today. As we get into the passage today, I want to acknowledge someone. I want to acknowledge uh, Richard Chin uh, for his excellent book called Captivated by Christ, which is a commentary on Colossians. Uh, in a week where I've really been struggling, struggling with post-COVID fatigue, I'm just really thankful for him. I've used a lot of his examples uh, here. It's been so helpful. I actually messaged him. I said, brother, you saved me this week. He said, that's all right. Use the book. So <laughs> just to let you guys know, it's a fantastic book. I really recommend it as well. But I'll be using a lot of his examples this week. Uh, quick recap uh, from the past weeks, uh, the past chapters. What, where have we been? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul has just reminded the Colossian church about their amazing new identities as citizens of heaven. This is who you are. And because of that, they are to live new transformed lives, completely different lives. Everything's going to change. And I want to start by going back here to this foundational relationship that we have. Whoops. Uh. Sorry. This is what we, where we need to start. Because if we don't grasp this relationship with Jesus rightly, as we, um, the relationship that we have, our new identities, we have no hope of living out relationships of peace. Okay, so Colossians 3.15. So we're just jumping a little bit back to the chapter from last week. Have a look at this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Do we see this? This is where peace actually starts. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ has brought about peace in the most important relationship in this world between us and God. He's brought us peace with God. He's put us right with God in a relationship where we were once warring against God, in conflict against God because of our sin, because of our rebellion, doing whatever we wanted, not doing what He wanted. He's put us right now. What was once broken is now repaired in Christ. Because by the cross, we can know God again and be known by God. Brothers and sisters, this is the first place, the first thing to grasp is to be thankful to Jesus. Did you see that? That's actually a command there. Be thankful to Jesus because he is your saviour that has brought you peace. 
But not only that, also be thankful to Jesus, your Lord. And verse 17 says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Jesus' relationship with us is one of lordship as well. Did you notice that? Over what areas of our life? Well, every single area of our life. Did you see that? Whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is what we need to get. This is where we need to start. Jesus is Lord of all. No area of our life remains untouched. No area of our life is off limits to him. He is the king of every single aspect of our life. And this is the, actually the overarching command that we, that we need to get because this is what every single command that we're going to look at today sits under. The fact that Jesus is Lord. Actually, in this section of nine verses, the word Lord comes up seven times over and over. Lord, Jesus is Lord. Live as though Jesus is your Lord. Do it in the name of Jesus, your Lord. Jesus' Lordship is the core of how we live. And we need to understand this. That relations of peace flow from our relations with Jesus as Lord. Okay, if you take away one thing, take away this. Relations of peace flow from our relationship with Jesus as Lord. More important than any practical tip that you get from today is this principle, because this will transform every single relationship you have. If you miss this, nothing else matters. Jesus has died and risen again for you, and now he is your Lord. And that means how you relate to everyone around you is transformed. Which means every single moment, every single moment, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, the only question you need to ask yourself is this, will this honour Jesus as my Lord? Will this honour Jesus as my Lord? If you take away one thing from the sermon today, it's this. Because if if you stop and ask this question, it will force you to stop looking inwards at your heart and what you want. And it will help you to cast your gaze upwards towards your Lord Jesus Christ. And from there, then your trans- your, all your relations will be transformed outwards to those beside you. Now I want to take a minute to just acknowledge something here. Um, the idea of Jesus as Lord, the idea of Jesus having authority over our lives, that's probably a little bit of an unpopular idea. Um, Firstly, we live in a nation where authority is not a big thing, is it? We don't really like authority very much, do we? Uh, I remember when Li Ching was telling me when she first came to Australia from Singapore, she was absolutely shocked at the disrespect that Australians had for their government. She she couldn't believe it. The way that we talk about our Prime Minister, I see a few guys laughing because yes, we make jokes about our government as well, right? Uh, That will never happen in Singapore. Yeah? You don't joke about your government like that. There's a disrespectful authority in Australia. That's part of our culture. We have tall poppy syndrome. We have people in authority. We want to cut them down. Authority isn't a big part of our culture. That's the first reason why authority is probably not very popular. But secondly, we live in a time where we've seen authority horrendously abused as well. Isn't it terrible that we need things like the Me Too movement to highlight the injustices and abuses that have been done against women by men, especially in the different workplaces. This is a horrible distortion of God's authority, and it's evil. And maybe you're here today, and you've been a victim of authority being welded over you like a weapon. In your family, your workplace, your relationships. And if that's you today, I can't begin to imagine the hurt and pain that you've gone through or might still be going through. I'm really sorry about that. And I'd invite you to please talk to me or the team about this as well so we can pray and help if we can. When we think about things like this, it's no wonder for many of us authority is a dirty word. It's a dirty word. But friends, we need to redeem the idea of authority. We need to redeem the idea of authority because the problem isn't authority itself. The problem is sinful humans. Because authority from Jesus Christ is different to anything we've ever seen. His authority isn't one-to-one 
isn't one to run away from, but to welcome gladly with open arms. His authority is good and loving and perfect. His authority is one that he was willing to lay down to die for us because he loved us so much. This is what true authority looks like as God intends. And this is authority that we need to be extremely thankful for. So, verse 17 at the end, if you have a look, it says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Giving thanks to God the Father. We should be extremely thankful for the fact that Jesus is Lord of our lives. This is a reluctant thing that we just have to undertake. It's not that we have to obey Jesus Christ, it's that we get to obey Jesus. It's a privilege, friends. Because the fact that we get to call Jesus Lord reminds us of something really, really important. It reminds us that we belong to Him. We belong to Him. And that changes everything. What a privilege now that we live a life where we aren't just lost in the darkness, just trying to figure out what to do, trying to rule our own lives and failing miserably, but we have Jesus Christ as our good King to guide us and to help us and provide for us. We get to live new transformed lives with the Holy Spirit helping us. We get to live as God has always intended us to live, with Jesus as our King, as our Lord. As we get into this passage today, we'll see something. We'll see not a picture of oppressive relationships. We'll see a picture of the beautiful life that God intends. Now, there's a pretty extended intro, but I think it's really important because this is probably more important than the specific commands. Just get this, friends. This is the picture of the beautiful life that God intends for us, Jesus as our Lord. Um, friends, as we begin to dig into the specifics of this passage, which really focus on family um, quite, quite closely, can I just address those who are single, separated, divorced, or who have suffered also abuse in marriage? Um, I want to acknowledge that as we dig into this topic, there may be pain here for all of you. And I pray, pray that through the word, God will still be able to encourage you today um, and comfort you today. And if, for those of us who... This doesn't apply to us, these certain life stages, being a wife, husband, child, um, a parent. Um, I hope that you can still listen to help our wider family here at CP, that we can love each other, to know the struggles that we all go through and how we can be encouraging each other as well. Okay? Let's love each other by doing this. Okay. With that, well, let's get stuck in. The first command is a command to wives. And this is the command... And here it sits under the bigger command of obeying Jesus as Lord. But verse 18 says this, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's a good one to start with, isn't it? Just an easy one. Let's be honest. These verses, they make us a little bit awkward, don't they? But they are so important. Why? Because this is God's plan for marriages that will flourish. This is God's good, ordered plan for marriage. And we have to really, really believe this if we want to live out beautiful relationships of peace, as God intended. What is submission? Well, submission is uh, placing yourself under the authority of another. Um, It's what you do every day when you listen to your teacher at school or you follow your boss's directions. Uh, Wives here are called to submit to their husbands, and here's a key part of the statement, as is, fitting in the Lord, as is fitting in the Lord. That last line is really important. To be fitting in the Lord, to be in good order, is to be in good order. What fits, you know? To be Christ-like in the way that we do this. Firstly, a fitting submission is firstly voluntary. This is a command to wives to undertake, not for men to enforce. It's about wives submitting themselves just as Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to his Father's will. And we need to be clear about this one. A fitting submission does not make you any less valuable as a person. Jesus wasn't unequal to his Father because he submitted to his Father's will. They're both fully gone. Uh, You are not unequal to the police officer uh, when you submit to their authority. You are both fully human, made in the image of God. And wives, if you choose to submit to your husbands, it doesn't mean you are unequal to him. You are doing what is fitting in the Lord. 
Also, of course, this means wives are not called to submit when their husbands demand something sinful against God's word. Or submission to him would uh, mean even more sin comes out of the relationship. If this is your situation, please seek help. Submission does not mean a wife becomes a doormat who isn't allowed an opinion. It doesn't mean that the wife becomes like a piece of property owned by the husband. What does it look like? Well, this is uh, my brother Richard Chin's definition on the screen here. Submission is this. It's willingly honouring your husband as God's appointed head over you and rejoicing in your husband's initiative to serve you, just as Jesus did with his father. A crucial ingredient to fitting submission is respect. Is respect. Now, the great marriage passage of Ephesians 5.33 points this out. Women you will find it very difficult to submit to your husbands if you do not respect them. Perhaps impossible. Yeah. And if your husbands don't feel respected, they won't be able to lead you well. Wives, here's one question. So I hope to give you all a question that you can be asking one another as you walk out. Wives, here's one question that you can ask your husbands. Maybe today. How can I help you feel more respected? And be humble to the response and be willing to change here for the sake of having a relationship of peace that is fitting in the Lord. All right, husbands, now it's your turn. Don't worry, I've got something for you as well. Yeah? So Colossians 3, 19 says this, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Men, maybe you thought you had it easy. You get the hardest job in the world. Because Paul gives an extended version of this command of Ephesians 5, 25. Do you know what it says? Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, you are called to love your wives like Christ loved the church. Do you know what that means? Do you realize what that entails? You give everything to your wives everything Jesus loved the church so much that he died for her this is costly sacrificial love and men this is what you are called to don't get married if you're not willing to lay down your life for your bride it means You love your wife. When you're tired after a long day of work and all you feel like doing is coming home and crashing on the couch and not talking to anyone, because Christ-like love isn't about you. It's selfless. It means you love your wife even when she's not very lovable, when she's nagging you and when she's critical about the things you do or don't do. Because Christ-like love loves even when it isn't deserved. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? It means you love your wife even when you don't feel like it, especially when you don't feel like it, because Christ-like love never gives up. It never gives up. What does this look like? Well, a few tips, a few quick tips. Firstly, is to cherish your wife. Maybe there's some of us here as husbands uh, who love our wives by providing for them financially, materially, which is fantastic, but how about emotionally? Husbands, here's your question to ask your wife. How can I help you feel more loved? How can I help you feel more loved? Ask that question, then listen to the answers, then do it. Buy those flowers, say more loving, encouraging words, give her more hugs, just be around more, whatever it is, whatever it takes. Love your wife, cherish your wife. Secondly, make submission a joy. Do you know how Jesus led? He led by serving. He was a servant leader. His disciples rejoiced in serving him because they knew Jesus loved and served them too. Here's a few statements that might help in your household. How about trying some things like this? Uh, Darling, let me take the garbage out. Please, let me take, change the baby's nappy. How about I cook tonight? I'll turn off the computer. And let's watch a show that you want to watch tonight. Um, 
I've stopped doing this recently, but um, I, this is something that I need to start doing again. But one of my practices when I used to get home from work um, was the first thing that I asked Li Ching was, how can I help? Even though it was the last thing I felt like doing at that point in time. But I tried to train myself to do that. And I think, um, yeah, something I need to start again. But I think saying things like this will make, joy, uh, make it a joy for your wife to submit to you as she knows that you are there to serve her and lead her in love. The third thing that will help is to take initiative to nourish your wife spiritually. Men, you are to be the one that says to your wife, let's pray together about this. You are to be the one that says, let's read God's word together. You are to make a plan so that your wife can be hearing God's word and growing. If reading together is hard, find other ways that you can be sharing God's word with her. Share, share things that you've been learning personally from God's word and reflect on that with her. Here's what God's been teaching me. Um, if you've got small kids, um, make sure that you offer to take them and sit in the creche so that she can be sitting out here listening to the sermon. So you can take turns and doing things like that, whatever it takes to help her grow. And as I say all these things, I'm preaching to myself once again. I need to be much better here too. This is hard. But there's nothing more important than to love your wives, men. Now I want to take some time to talk about the second half of this statement. If you look at Colossians 3.19, and the second half of the statement, what does it say? It says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do not be harsh with them. Men, I can't stress this enough. Being harsh with your wife is completely the opposite of everything you are called to do as a husband. Let me say a few things to you. Um, here's a few things that will help us never be harsh with our wives. Number one, never demand submission from your wife, especially in the area of sex. Submission is voluntary. It's not for you to command. Number two, never think about disciplining your wife. You discipline a child you do not discipline your wives. Number three, never ever abuse your wife emotionally, spiritually, or physically. It seems a bit like a no-brainer that I shouldn't even need to say this, but all these things I need to point out because it happens. And if you're sitting here today and you're thinking to yourself maybe, what counts as abuse? When is it actually abuse? Well, may I suggest that maybe you've already crossed the line there if you're even thinking about that question you may already be sinning against your wife. You should be running so far in the direction of love that this should never even come into the frame of things as a possibility. Here's a question. Um, is your wife afraid of you? This should never, ever be the case. Women or men, if I can take a minute to speak to men as well, women or men, if you are a victim of abuse, then please, please talk to someone, find some help. Talk to the pastoral staff, talk to myself here, Pastor Matt, the rest of the team, we can find some help for you, we can help you. Find us after the service, leave us a note on the connect cards, we're here to help. Yeah. Well, the next group Paul talks to in this passage is children and fathers, a command to children and fathers. Colossians 3, verse 20. Children, Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, who's being addressed here? Well, the children being addressed here obviously are old enough that they understand the command, so he's not talking to infants and things like this, um, but they're, uh, and they're young enough, so the command to obey your parents in everything applies. Okay, so adults, here's something to note. If you're an adult, you are not called to obey your parents in everything. Okay? You are called to honour them, but not obey like a young child. I hope you know that. That's just something to make clear. But if you are a child, if you are a child, and if you're dependent on your parents and teenagers, this applies to you, okay? This is for the teenagers here especially that are listening. You are called to do this, to obey your parents in everything. And I know this is hard, okay? It's hard. But this honors Jesus. Because this is the plan that he's put in place for the family. It's not your parents' fault, okay? This is God's plan. He's decided that parents are to parent, not the kids. And you have to trust him. He knows what he's doing. 
But parents, let me talk to you for a minute. You have a role to play here to make obedience easy for your children. I've been watching uh, this show on Channel 9 called Parental Guidance. Has anyone watched that show? Anyone Parental Guidance? Yeah? Am I the only one that watches reality TV here? Yeah, Ben? Yeah, I know you watch it, mate. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ben, for backing me up. Uh, it's a good show, actually. I, I do actually do really recommend it for um, any, anyone. It's quite interesting seeing how families interact and actually thinking, what are the values and the principles that are playing here? It's a reality TV show about parents and their kids and different parenting styles. Um, the Tiger parents are there as well. It's quite, they're quite interesting to watch. Um, I've been watching the show, and it's helped me reflect on a few things, actually. It's ref helped me reflect on my parenting and how easily... I can degrade into barking commands at my kids, like an army commander or something, and, make, and expecting that they just obey like that. I just bark and shout commands at them. I say, you know, um, and, I, and then I get upset when they don't do it straight away. Yeah. Does anyone else sometimes parent like that? They just shout at the kids and command, command them to do things? Something I'm trying really hard to do is change my tone. Um, I've noticed there's a big difference if I ask my kids gently to actually say, hey, Tash, would you mind setting the table for Dad? Rather than saying, Tasha, set the table now. Hurry up. There's a big difference there, you know, the way that I can love my family. We don't like being talked to like that as adults, do we? So why don't we talk to our kids like that? Yeah. So parents, you have a role to play here too. Uh, and, one, and we'll move on to verse 21. Have a look at verse 21 with me. Fathers... Do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Um, I think it's quite telling that fathers are addressed here. Um, I think it highlights the big responsibility that fathers have in their families. Yeah? So mums actually aren't addressed in this passage, you know? Um, so fathers, you have a big responsibility in your families. Don't outsource it to your wives, okay, to lead your families. It also highlights something too, the particular tendency towards sin that fathers have. Now, I'm not, I'm not naturally super warm and cuddly, uh, and um, maybe it's the way I've been raised too. Uh, you know, my household is the type that if I fell down and I hurt myself, it would be like, stop crying, get up again, you know. Uh, you might sympathise with that. Um, which means that I think often I've lacked compassion towards my kids. And I've said harsh things to my kids. Um, I shout things to them when I'm frustrated, like, why can't you just use your brain? Or saying things like, you always leave a mess, or you never think of anyone else. And I've seen those words hurt my kids, and I'm quite ashamed of that. Fathers and mothers, secondarily, our call is to encourage our children. Encourage our children. Are your words building your kids up or are they tearing your kids down? Fathers, here's a question to ask your kids. How can I help you feel more encouraged? Or if that word's a bit big for them, how can I help you feel more loved? Wouldn't that be great? Imagine asking your kids that and seeing what they said. All those questions I've been saying, imagine just asking those questions in your relationships. How can I f help you feel more respected? How can I help you feel more loved? And actually listening to the responses. That would transform our relationships. And let's move on to Colossians 3.22. So have a look in your Bibles. With me, this is a bit longer. So let's have Colossians 3.22. Yeah. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eyes are on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart, and reverence for the Lord. Now, I must apologise here. We just don't have time today to talk about this practically. And I just sort of ran out of steam, just to be honest, <laughs> um, to prepare. But I hope to cover this somewhere else. Maybe I'll make a little video or something cover it, because I think it's important, but we don't have time uh, to cover this practically in detail today. But um, what I do want to do is I want to end on these verses, because I think it really highlights a principle here, which brings us full circle. Have a look at verse 23 now. I keep going. Verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Does it sound familiar, these verses? 
It's pretty much exactly what was said right at the start in verse 17. Everything, absolutely everything you do, whatever you do, do it for Jesus Christ as your Lord. Everything starts with our relationship to Jesus as Lord. Friends, you need to remember this. Relations of peace flow from our relations with Jesus as Lord. Let me ask you, wouldn't you love to see your marriage flourish? Wouldn't you love to have deep connections with your children? Kids, wouldn't you love to have a deep trusting relationship with your parents? Wouldn't you love to see every relationship you have around you just filled with joy? Filled with joy. Well, you can, with God's help. He's got a plan for us, and He promises to be with us, transforming us by the Spirit as we strive to live with Jesus Christ as Lord. It all starts there. Friends, never stop asking this question in your relations. Will this honor Jesus as Lord? If you live like this, I genuinely believe that your relationships will be blessed because your relationships will reflect more and more not what you want, but what God wants. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me pray. Father God, we give great thanks to you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour, the one who has won us peace with you and the one who gives us the power now to live lives that are transformed and at peace with those around us. Father God, we know we stumble. We know we fail so often in these areas of loving those around us. Please forgive us. And we thank you that you give us the strength to continue on and the grace to be changed day by day to love just a little bit more like Jesus Christ does. Father God, may we always have firmly in our minds Jesus Christ as our Lord, and may everything else flow out to transform the relationships that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Iggy, for that word. I think that's what God's intention and desire is for families, for husbands and wives, father and children, to really live in peace and in harmony with one another.